Okay guys, welcome to your first video lecture for uh, Journalism 341 Broadcast News Writing. I am recording this in our home office and my children are home from school. So you may occasionally uh, see a tiny person running past or you may hear tiny voices. Uh, the children have been home for a week now and they have pretty much gone feral. <laughs> they, uh, they have no schedule. They have no filter. They are constantly looking for snacks and attention. So we will try to do our best to move ahead with this lecture and not be distracted uh, by them. So we are going to cover this week and the first part of next week, two chapters of what your textbook would be, which is uh, chapter 12, Reporting Live, and then chapter 14, which is voiceovers, packages, and story formats. So the first part of the lecture, or what corresponds with chapter 12 of your textbook, it talks a little bit about um, things you may encounter when you're out in the field reporting live. And then chapter 13 is where we're really gonna do the deep dive because that's when we're gonna talk about uh, the different types of story formats there are in television news. Uh, the most common ones that we'll talk about will be readers, voiceovers, voiceover tape, and then packages. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of vocab along with this lesson, um, but the most important things to focus on are the types of story formats. So make sure you know what a reader is, uh, VO, a VO uh, SOT, and a package, and I will tell you what those are in this lecture. And then also you should be very familiar with, um, after this lecture, how to prepare a split page script. And uh, part of your assignment is going to actually be to put together a couple split page scripts um, there's going to be an example posted on Canvas of a split page script. We'll talk about that in this lecture too. And um, I thought I would do one long video, but in order to make these videos easier to post on YouTube, I'm going to do two shorter videos. So you will have two videos that go along with this lecture. You need to make sure you watch both those videos before March 31st, so before next Tuesday. And then on March 31st, I'm going to have you watch a newscast. I'm going to give you a link to watch a newscast. And then we're going to have just a short check-in assignment asking you questions about that newscast uh, to see if you indeed watched it and understand the elements that were at play there. Uh, so make sure you watch these next two videos. Uh, I'll, you know, put them as uh, lecture one, part one, and lecture one, part two. Uh, before March 31st, so you can watch like one video this week, one video next week, or you can watch them both at once. Um, doesn't matter to me. Just make sure you do watch both of them. And then um, I will also post a video explaining the assignments. And then uh, next week on March 31st, I'll post a short video telling you about the newscast I want you to watch and what I want you to look out for. So um, there'll be lots of videos for you to go over, but you don't have to do them in real time. You can kind of do them at your own pace. Okay, so first we're going to talk about reporting live, uh, which is again chapter 12 of your book. Okay, so when you're reporting live, the best advantage that broadcast has over print is our ability to immediately break a story. Um, you know, if a newspaper is going to tell a story, they got to print it, they got to run the newspaper. It takes time, and usually newspapers only come out once a day. With broadcasts, both radio and television, as soon as we know something, we can go on the air with the information that we have. Uh, radio news stations usually have news at the top of every hour, if not both the top and bottom of every hour. Television news usually has a newscast in the morning, uh, they usually have a noon newscast, and of course they have a 5 p.m., a 6 p.m., and a 10 p.m. But they also have several teasers that they uh, air throughout the day, letting people know about uh, stories that they, they broke that are coming up. Um, they put everything online, and a lot of times there's a race to be the first online, even uh, among newspapers. And uh, also, if it's a big enough story, you know, they can interrupt regularly scheduled programming, television can, and go live with a story. And um, we have seen that with terrorist attacks. You know, obviously um, on 9-11, uh, most stations went wall-to-wall -wall TV coverage. If there's um, severe weather, if there's a tornado, like we had last May, uh, a lot of television stations will interrupt their regularly scheduled program to bring you information on that. 
So that's the biggest advantage that um, TV and radio have over print is that they can get the news out immediately. Uh, stations also use reporters in the field. They are not just sitting in a newsroom and listening to uh, scanners, although there are people that do that. They have a team that they send out, and if there's a story that's breaking somewhere, if they hear something come over the scanner, or they know something's going to be happening, something's planned, they send people out to cover it live. Um, usually radio does break a story before television does, just because they're on more. Like I said, television has set times when they go on. Usually it's noon, 5, 6, and 10 p.m., and radio's going on at 10 a.m., 11 a.m., 12 p.m., 1 p.m., 2 p.m. So usually radio will break a story first, but sometimes television does. And if you're going to do a live shot, if you are going to roll the news van out and raise the satellite dish and go through the trouble and the expense of having a live shot, having a reporter live at the scene and bringing you live footage, you should have a reason. In other words, it should be an important story. You don't want to, you know, just send your reporter out to cover every single ribbon cutting and every single tiny event that's taking place in the community. Uh, live shots should have a reason. And I think sometimes there's a trend in television these days to uh, use live shots when they're not really necessary. Um, one of my biggest complaints is uh, weather channels when there's a hurricane. They'll send a reporter out to stand in the rain and he's being blown around by the wind and you can see the severe conditions all around him and it's like, that's not really necessary. I think you can convey to people that, you know, the weather's bad, there's a hurricane without actually having someone out there uh, being pummeled by the weather. So live shots should have a reason. Live shots should be for an important story or a story that is very visual and has very compelling visuals. Fires usually have very compelling visuals. Fire looks cool on TV. Um, so those are the sort of stories that are going to use a live shot. Sorry. Still trying to get the hang of my daughter's laptop here. So when you're out in the field, you need to be able to organize your thoughts. Hopefully you will develop a skill if you don't already have it for ad libbing. Ad libbing just means talking off the cuff, talking uh, without a script, talking uh, and filling time sometimes. Sometimes you are just filling time. Sometimes you are trying to relay a lot of information to the audience in a short amount of time. A lot of times if you're in the field covering something, you are relaying information to an audience that you literally just learned. Like you're going on live at six o'clock and they just had a update from the police about the murder investigation that you're, you know, at, at 550. So you have to be good at ad-libbing. Uh, the greatest demand for ad-libbing is usually on the radio uh, because, like I said, television news is very scheduled. You go on at 5, you go on at 6, you go on at 10. On the radio, you go on at the top of every hour, and a lot of times radio will break into a broadcast more often than television will because it's easier you know, they don't have to worry about visuals. They don't have to worry about usually interrupting a network program. So radio will break in if there's breaking news uh, a lot quicker than television will. So if you're going to work in radio, especially, you have to be able to add lead and thing on your feet. Uh, so every reporter, <coughs> I always say you should have a notebook and a pencil. Uh, these days, most reporters have a phone, and that's what they use. They use the notes section on their phone to take notes and that's great. I think you should do that and if you're most comfortable with that, uh, use that. I do it myself. I take notes on my phone all the time and refer back to it. However, if you're gonna be you know, at a news situation, a developing news situation for hours on end and you might not have access to a charger or there might be weather elements to deal with, it's always a good idea to have a notebook and a pencil backup in case your phone dies or your phone breaks or you don't have a signal or you can't get uh, you know, reception wherever you are. It's always a good idea to have a low-tech backup. And a notebook and a pencil, it's about as low-tech and basic as you get. So what are you writing in this notebook? Well, important facts. Um, you shouldn't write out scripts because those are going to be kind of hard to, uh, to write. You should just have bullet points that you want to cover. So you're going to have important facts in bullet points. You might have important comments that someone made if someone gave you a really good quote. You might want to write down that quote verbatim. Uh, you're going to want to write down times in your notebook. Um, you know, a lot of times if you're at a situation where the police are there investigating, 
they'll say, you know, we'll come and give you an update at 5.30 and then we'll give you another update at 6. So you're going to want to write down those times so you know that you're where you need to be at those times. Uh, also might be a good idea to learn a little bit about speed writing or develop a shorthand. You don't necessarily have to use the official shorthand uh, that uh, is taught by, to secretaries and whatnot, but you might want to develop your own abbreviations and your own shorthand that you understand so you don't have to worry about writing down every word someone is saying. Because if you are out in the field and you are interviewing a police officer, he is not going to slow down or repeat himself for you if you missed something he said. So you need to make sure that you can get all the facts um, very quickly written down. So what are some of the key differences between reporting live and radio and reporting live and television? Usually radio reporters operate solo. Uh, if there is a story, the radio station will send one reporter out to get audio and interviews and develop the story. Um, usually radio newsrooms are just smaller than television newsrooms. TV uh, will sometimes send out at least two people. A lot of times, it used to be that a television station would always send out a reporter and a camera person. That used to be how things went. Uh, but now newsrooms are shrinking because of budget cuts. So a lot of times now the reporter is the camera person. So TV might just send out one person. But if it's a big story, if it's a big deal, and the TV station knows they want to do a live shot, then they will probably send out a reporter and one person to operate the news van. Uh, the news van is what they need to go live. And I'm sure you guys have seen news vans with that big antenna that they crank up into the sky. That's what they need when they're gonna do a live shot. So usually there's gonna be at least two people in the van if they're using it. Uh, as I said, radio reporters go live more often. They have more newscasts to do and they will break into uh, regularly scheduled programming to give you updates on news. Also, radio reporters often have to edit their own tape. Now, all they have usually is audio. Some radio reporters do take video now for the web, but it used to be that, you know, they just had audio, so they could edit their own tape in the field pretty easily. Uh, TV reporters, if they're stuck in a situation where they're going to be out there for several hours because they're going to keep doing live shots from the scene, they may get their tape and send it back to the station and have someone at the station edit the tape for them. And usually that's kind of a low ranking job. Interns will have to edit videotape for their reporters a lot. Uh, so if you ever intern at a TV station, you might have some experience doing that or uh, entry level people uh, are going to be there to edit tape. So if you are going to be continuing your education here at Lincoln, uh, definitely take classes that require you to learn how to edit tape because if you can edit tape, you can get an entry level job somewhere. Okay. Uh, and often radio reporters are not seen. You hear their voice, but you don't see their faces unless they're posting videos online. But TV reporters are on camera, so they have to look presentable uh, at all times. So ad-libbing. Ad-libbing is speaking without a script. It's a skill you need uh, to develop if you're going to be reporting live. Um, I reported live a lot. I worked at a radio station that was a news focused station. We did breaking news all the time. We covered severe weather. And um, I learned how to basically arrive at, the, at a scene of a story, get some information, and immediately turn around and ad lib a report of just what I've been told. Um, it requires you to have an excellent memory to remember the details that you were given. It requires you to be able to think on your feet and it requires you to be able to speak clearly and intelligently and um, without relying on a script. Um, you need to be prepared for questions if you're doing a live report. I'm sure you guys have seen it. The anchors are back at the newsroom and they're saying, uh, you know, now we're going to go to Gloria Inlow, who's live at the scene. Gloria, tell us what's going on. And then I'm telling them, you know, the situation that I know. And many times the anchor is going to ask a question. Hopefully, it's a question that I have the answer to, and hopefully it's not a question that's from out of left field, but you have to be prepared. They might ask you a question that you don't know the answer to or that seems kind of weird. Sometimes the anchors are stretching for time. Sometimes they are just generally wanting to know the information. So you got to be prepared for those questions. 
Um, you should have keywords and phrases in your head that you're going to rely on to use. Uh, you can even write those keywords and phrases down on a piece of paper. Um, when you are giving a live report, don't think of the fact that you are talking to um, a camera that is uh, delivering a video out to possibly millions of people. Think of talking to one person. Like if your colleague showed up at the scene and you were telling them what you knew, that's what you should be telling the camera. So think of talking to one person. Don't try to sound perfect, okay? Uh, the audience knows that you're live at the scene, that you haven't had a whole lot of time to prepare, that you are bringing them urgent and new information that you haven't had time to script and be perfect on. You don't want to try to sound like you are a machine that's just reading a piece of paper. That's really boring. Um, reading is really boring for someone to listen to. You know, when you are talking to your friends, you don't read them a script that you've prepared. You're just talking to them, so you're engaging them. So that's what you want to sound like, like you're talking to your friends. Um, and even though you're ad-libbing, it's important that you don't speculate. Tell the audience what you know, but not uh, what you think or what the rumors are, because that's how uh, misinformation gets spread. With this uh, COVID-19, we have seen all kinds of um, misinformation being spread online, and often it's because someone is speculating about something and they don't actually have any basis for that. So don't speculate, don't guess, just tell the audience what it is you do know. The challenges of ENG, ENG stands for Electronic News Gathering. Okay, the challenges of Electronic News Gathering. This is both radio and television. First of all, the pressure is on. Uh, a lot of times you are sent out at a story that you had no idea was going to happen, okay? Some things you go out to are planned. Sometimes you know there's going to be a press conference. Sometimes you know the president is going to be giving a speech. Sometimes you know um, a murder suspect is going to be appearing in court. But a lot of times you go to work and you don't know that you're going to cover a fire that day. You don't know that you're going to cover a fatal car wreck. And you don't know that you're going to cover a shooting. But suddenly you're there and the pressure is on. You're trying to get a lot of information. Sometimes the scene is chaotic. Sometimes you don't have a lot of time. You know, it's 5.30 and they sent you out to cover the story and they want you to have a report ready at 6. So the pressure is on. Sometimes you get somewhere and you just don't have a lot of information. There are some police departments and um, officials that are very good about talking to the press and want to keep the press informed and use the press to their advantage. You know, if they're looking for a murder suspect, they want to tell the press, you know, what the murder suspect looks like and where he might be and where, uh, what people should be on the lookout for. But sometimes police officers or officials don't really care about the press and don't want to have to talk to them. And so you're their last concern. And so you might be there a while before you get any information. Uh, the background can be distracting. Like I said, things can be chaotic. There can be lights, there can be sirens, there can be a lot of noise. Uh, so there's a distracting background. But despite all that, you must remain accurate. Again, just tell the audience what you know and what you have been told, not what you think. So you have to remain accurate and you must attribute. If you are at a scene of a murder and the police say, we have arrested the suspect. This guy who did this is Timothy Clark. You can't just go on and say, Timothy Clark committed murder. You have to say, the police department says Timothy Clark did this. You always have to tell us where you got your information from. So usually it's going to be a police department or the highway patrol or the sheriff's department. But wherever you're getting your information from, attribute it. Tell us who told you this. Did the police tell you this? Did the prosecuting attorney tell you this? Did the judge tell you this? The judge isn't going to tell you anything ever. But, you know, who, who told you? Who, where did you get your information from? Um, and, again, that also covers you. Because you, the reporter, are not saying Timothy Clark is a murderer. The police department is saying Timothy Clark is a murderer. And the police get to say that. But you, as a reporter, don't get to say that. You get to tell us who's telling you this information. Keeping cool under pressure. <laughs> sometimes you will have technical problems in the field. Um, sometimes, hopefully, it's something simple. Like your tape recorder ran out of batteries or you ran out of space on a chip that you're using. Um, and you have backups, and so you're prepared for that. 
Uh, sometimes your equipment stops working and you don't know why. Sometimes, especially if you're doing a live shot with the van, there's all kinds of technical things that can go wrong. So just keep it cool. And I'm sure you guys have all seen examples of a newscast where the anchor is talking to the reporter and the reporter is just staring off because they haven't heard what the anchor said because there's a technical problem. One of the worst things you can say is, are we on? Because that makes you look like an amateur and like you don't know what you're doing. If you are on, <laughs> you will know that you're on. Someone will signal to you. So don't be asking technical type questions on the air. Uh, don't dwell on or point out mistakes. If you stumble over a word or you um, mispronounce something, don't point it out, don't dwell on it, don't repeat it, just go on, okay? Just pretend like nothing ever happened. Memorizing and delivering. So, memorizing anything longer than 20 seconds is pretty tough, um, especially if you are, you know, having to get a report out really quickly. So I would recommend that you really not try to memorize like a script verbatim in your head. Just try to memorize the key points and then the rest of the script is something you are going to have to ad lib. Um, if you are at, at the scene of something, don't just uh, stand there and have the background going on behind you. Show the people what is happening. You may actually have to step out of frame and just show the video of the live video of what's happening to the audience. So don't stand there like a mannequin. Uh, be active, walk around, get, for, get different angles. Um, you might point out specific things to an audience by walking and pointing out to certain things that they need to look at and be paying attention to. Um, so you're not gonna memorize lines and lines of dialogue. What you're gonna remember is those bullet points, those bullet points of information. Um, it's fine to have notes in your hand, but don't be married to them. You don't want to be staring at your piece of paper and just reading to the audience. And that's really amateurish. You should be looking at the camera as often as possible. Glance down at your notes briefly to refresh your memory and then go back to the camera. Uh, when you're talking to the camera, you're going to want to use what's called the dining table solution. The dining table solution means you are telling the story in a conversational sense as if you were talking to your family around the dining table. So like when you guys sit down to dinner and you're talking about, oh, what happened to you today? That's when you tell them the story of, you know, this horrible homicide that happened or this fatal fire that killed a bunch of people or this car wreck that you went to. You're telling a story as if you're telling it to your friends and family who are there with you. Now, you don't want to get so conversational that you start using slang words or jargon or buzzwords or make it lighthearted if it's a serious story, but you do want to act like you're having a conversation with someone instead of just reading a script to them. And one of the benefits of this ad-libbing and not being able to write everything out is you get rid of a lot of minutia. Uh, your story isn't gonna be super long because you don't have a lot to say, you don't have a lot that you remember. And so it really kind of boils the story down to the nuts and bolts. voiceovers from the heel field so sometimes you will hear the anchor talking and while they're talking while they're reading a story to you there's video footage playing and a lot of times hopefully the video footage matches up with what the anchor is saying the anchor is saying you know there was a train derailment in Jefferson City today a train went off the tracks killing five people and while she is talking there's a video of the train wreck and showing the crashed train and all the um, all the things. Um, so you may have b-roll playing while the reporter is talking as well. It's not always the anchor back in the studio. Sometimes the reporter is actually live on the scene and talking while there is video playing. What is b-roll, you may ask? B-roll is video footage of whatever news story it is you're covering. Um, so if you're covering a train derailment, your b-roll will include shots of the train shots of maybe luggage strewn about a field, uh, shots of victims laying under sheets, shots of victims walking around with injuries. So different shots that you would need. If you're covering a court trial, your B-roll would include maybe a video footage from in the courtroom, including the judge and the defendant at, the, you know, at his table talking to his lawyer and the person who's on the stand. 
Um, it might include shots of the courthouse itself, okay? Um, there are some technical challenges when you do a voiceover from the field. Like I said, there can be equipment failures. Uh, sometimes it's hard to get a signal. Sometimes it's hard to connect. Um, sometimes there's just uh, technical challenges you can't overcome. So you have to be ready for those. Some of those technical challenges. Um, there's a communication chain, chain when you go out and cover something. You're in the field. When you are sent to cover a story, if it is not in the newsroom, that is considered being in the field. And you are communicating from the field back to the newsroom. You might be talking to an anchor who's actually live on the air giving the news. Um, you might be talking to the news director because it's a few minutes before they have to go on and he needs to know uh, the information. Uh, you may be talking to a, an assignment editor. You might be talking to a producer. But there has to be communication from the field back to the newsroom. Uh, some of the things that might need to go from the field to the newsroom would be video from that field, that B-roll we talked about, uh, which B-roll, think of B as uh, kind of being for background. Uh, those are the shots that you're going to need. Um, other video from the field could include interviews that you did with officials there live on the scene. Uh, there's also audio from the field. Usually you only have one mic, so you have uh, the audio you might have might be, like I said, those interviews from people you talk to at the field. Uh, there also might be what's called NAT sound, N-A-T sound, NAT sound, which is short for natural sound. Um, you know, you might want to have sound of sirens going off. If there's a fire, you may want that crackle uh, that the sound that the fire makes. You might have some natural sound in the background. Um, there's a couple different ways you can get that uh, audio and video back to the newsroom. One is you can use an open engineering phone line. Uh, so when you have a news station, generally they have a dozen phone lines, a different, dozen different phone numbers that you could call to get through. Uh, they have, you know, the listener line that listeners call into to request songs or give you information. They have, you know, the number to the uh, assignment editor's desk and the news director's desk. But a lot of times there's what's called an engineering phone line, and that means that line is supposed to remain open as often as possible. So if you can't get through on any other line, you're gonna call that engineering phone line. You also might have what's called an IFB, an interrupted feedback line. An interrupted feedback line returns audio from the studio. And so a lot of times, I mean, if you're going out and you're covering something, they'll tell you, you know, we have an IFB. So now that we've talked a little bit about what it's like to be out in the field, we're going to start talking about television stories, story formats. So when you're talking about television, you're combining words and pictures. Okay, words and pictures. And that is an advantage that television has over radio, is that we are able to show the audience visually what is happening. We have cool pictures. And there's a lot of debate over what's more important. Are the words more important or are the pictures more important? And uh, if you want to, you can comment, uh, you know, on the, in the video below and tell us what you think, if the words are more important or the pictures are more important. Uh, you don't want to use too many words, even though I think words are important, just because you want to be brief and you want to let the visuals do their job. Um, for example, if you are showing video, you should never be telling the audience what they're seeing. So for right now, say we have, um, you know, video footage of a grocery store and all the toilet paper is gone. The shelves are bare. So you're showing a picture of the grocery store and there's nothing on the shelves. You wouldn't want to say something like, as you can see, the shelves are bare. We don't need those words. We can see the empty shelves. So we don't need you to tell us what we're seeing you need to be telling us why we're seeing it okay shoppers have been stocking up on toilet paper and other essentials cleaning many stores out and stores are struggling to stay stocked okay um, if you are covering a COVID-19 story say you're at a hospital or another testing site you wouldn't want to say as you can see the doctors and nurses here are wearing masks we can see that they're wearing masks you don't need to tell us that your words should always add something to the story 
as opposed to just describing what's being shown. So if you're showing pictures of doctors and nurses wearing masks, instead of saying, as you can see, they're wearing masks to protect themselves, you might say, you know, they're working 12 hour shifts. They don't have enough people to take care of all the patients. Uh, so you're going to have to use words and pictures, and everyone writes in a television newsroom. It's not just the anchors who write or just the reporters who write. Anchors write copy, reporters write copy, producers write copy. Everyone has to be able to write some copy. So this class that you're taking is vital. You need to be able to write television news. So the first type of story we're going to talk about is the easiest and most basic type of story there is, and that is a reader. So a reader is a story that is read by the anchor without the use of pictures. And I am sure if you think back to newscasts you have seen, you have seen anchors reading a reader. Okay? They are short stories, usually no more than 30 seconds, and it's just the anchor telling you a story. There's no reporter in the field. There's no live shot. There's no video that you're watching. It's just the anchor sitting at the desk, looking at the camera, telling you the news. Okay? So visually, it's the least interesting story that there is. Um, because seeing a person sitting at a desk reading the news is kind of not that interesting. Now, some people really love anchors and want to see their faces and get excited about seeing them. But it's not very visually compelling. However, it does allow the audience to see and connect with the anchor. And if you are ever on camera, you will learn that there are people who really feel connected to the anchors and love the anchors and want to see them and feel like they know them, even though they've never met them, because let's face it, they see them on TV two or three times a day, every day. They feel like they know this person. They trust this person. They develop a, a relationship with this person. It's one-sided, but it is a relationship. Um, you know, there are people who will only watch Teresa Snow, or there are people who will only trust one reporter. So, um, you know, the newsrooms want to use their anchors, and so they do have anchors do readers occasionally. Um, other reasons they might put a reader in is there's no video available. Um, maybe it's uh, too early to get video back to the station. Maybe they weren't allowed to bring cameras on the scene of what they were covering. Um, maybe it's just really... Um, not a visually compelling story. So there might be no video available. It also might be a story that, quite frankly, isn't important enough to require video. It might be a story about, you know, the school board deciding that they're going to um, enact a new dress code. It might not be something that is important enough to require video. It might just be a little short story that they throw in towards the end of the newscast. Uh, they also might have video, but it's video that would be fairly dull. Um, you know, if it's a meeting, sometimes meetings are really boring. It's just like 12 people sitting around a table going over a PowerPoint presentation. It's not all that uh, compelling. So they would, you know, they wouldn't use video because the video would be dull. And also you use a reader because sometimes you want to break up the pace of your newscast. Newscasts can kind of get predictable. You're like, okay, they're going to do a package on this and then they're going to do another package and another package and then another package and another package. Sometimes you want to throw a reader in there to break up the repetitiousness and the monotony of a television newscast. So um, one of the things you're going to do for your assignment is to uh, write a reader. You're going to write a 20 second reader. So what you should do is find a story either online or in a newspaper. And don't worry, I'm going to go over this in a separate video. Uh, to get really specific, but find a story and boil it down to 20 seconds and write a reader for it. Now remember when you were writing your radio news stories to use those same principles here. Present tense leads, short sentences, not a lot of specific details. I don't need addresses, I don't need ages, I don't need middle names, I don't need all that minutia, okay? Write a reader just like you would write a radio story. Now, when an anchor is reading a reader, they might just keep the camera on the anchor and have the anchor's face up the whole time.
They might also, while the anchor is talking, put up a full page graphic on the screen. If the anchor is talking about, you know, a robbery, they might have a graphic that says robbery and shows, you know, a person in a black ski mask on the screen and that's their robbery graphic. Or um, they might do what's called an OTS. OTS means over the shoulder. That's where over the anchor's shoulder there's a little box and it has either a graphic or a picture in it. Okay? Um, readers are great because you can drop them if you're not going to use them, if you're running out of time in your newscast, or you can add more. Okay? You can write them up really quick and use them to fill some time. That's that pad copy we talked about the first part of the semester. Extra stories that you have in case you need to fill time. So, when you're writing for television, you're combining the words and pictures. You don't necessarily need a lot of words. Again, don't tell viewers what they're seeing. Okay? So, here's an example um, of a story. So, let's say you're going to a family festival and it's in the park. Okay? And you've got some video of people walking around on the playground. You see video of two kids going up and down on the teeter-totter. You might see uh, a couple of kids on swings. You might see parents watching their kids and smiling as they see them play. So you've got all these different pictures and the audience can see exactly what you're seeing. So let's say you decide to say something like this. Saturday in the park brought out dozens of people. Do I need you to tell me that or can I see that there's dozens of people out there? Okay. Two kids played on the seesaw, going up and down. Judging by their smiles, they both seemed to be having a good time. Even their parents were happy to be there. Okay, so what you have done, done is wasted a bunch of words and read some really boring copy. I don't need you to tell me that kids are going up and down on seesaw if I can see that they're going up and down on seesaw. I don't need you to tell me that they have smiling faces because I can see that they're smiling. I can see that their parents are smiling. So don't tell me uh, that story. Instead, what you should do is use the touch and go principle. The touch and go principle means you are tying together video and narration. So your video is establishing where you are. The video is showing us we're at the park, okay? Then any narration advances the story while the video maintains the storyline. So the narration is very important because the narration is the story and the video is just keeping the audience tied to that part. So the video keeps playing and we keep seeing park shots until the audience knows we're still at the park, we're still talking about the park, but they're listening to what the anchor says. So instead of telling us, you know, about the teeter-totters and the kids' smiling faces, we say something more like this. Saturday in the park brought out dozens of people, but moments like this are in jeopardy with state budget cuts. The latest proposal would remove 15% of money from parks and recreation. First to go, local parks. So now we know, because of the touch and go principle, that we're talking about parks, and the story is about how parks are going to get hit in the latest round of budget cuts, and so we might not see these parks and these people in these parks like we used to. Okay? So you touch the first video in the sequence, the park we know it's the park you're telling us it's the park maybe you tell us which park it is then you go into a solid narration that expands the story so why are we at the park what's the story about the park stories about how budget cuts are going to hit the parks so um if you're doing a story about a trial the first establishing shot might be the courthouse why are we at the courthouse because inside um davy jones is learning his fate in the murder trial of blackbeard Okay, so that opening shot tells the audience where they are, ties the audience into the story. Your narration is what's actually telling the audience what's happening, though. Okay, so now we've talked about combining words and pictures. We've talked about readers. Readers are one story format. Another story format is a voiceover or a VO. This is the simplest video story there is. It's kind of the basic video story. It's tier one, it's where everyone starts. So what it is, is the anchor or the reporter is reading some copy while video or other visuals are shown. 
So let's go back to that train derailment story. Okay. The train derailed um, on the uh, in Jefferson City. So you are saying as the anchor, cleanup workers hope to get this accident under control after a Comrail freight train left its tracks last night. So while you're talking, what the audience is seeing is pictures of the derailed train. Okay. Uh, the video that you are showing, that's your B-roll. That video can be silent, or you can have some natural sound playing underneath the video. Um, it is really kind of a judgment call. Sometimes people like to have natural sound because it's just more um, realistic. You know, when you go out, you, you generally you hear background noises. You hear some natural sound. You don't exist in a vacuum. Um, but you might want to cut the natural sound if it's loud or it's too distracting or if it's going to detract from the story in some way. The copy that's being read, what the anchor is reading or what the reporter is reading should, again, complement the video. It should go along with the video. It should match up with the video, but not tell the audience exactly what they're seeing. So you might want to say, as you can see here, this train ran off the tracks last night. Don't need you to tell us that because we can see the train ran off the tracks. Instead, you can say, crews are trying to figure out why this train went off the tracks last night. Because the audience can't determine that from a picture of a crashed train. The audience can figure out the train crash went off the tracks, but they need you to tell them what they can't see. Okay? So with a voiceover, um, you're going to have to get used to cutting your video down. A voiceover might only be 20 seconds long, might only be 30 seconds long, uh, but you went out and got, you know, 10 minutes worth of video. Um, if you know that it's going to be a 20 or 30 second story, maybe cut down on the amount of video you get. Maybe you shoot five minutes of video. Maybe you have two minutes of video. Um, but basically what you want to do is go out and get different types of shots. So if you are taking a video uh, of the train wreck, you're going to want to get a wide shot, you know, kind of showing the scale of the destruction so that you're going to want to get medium shots too of maybe the crumpled front end of the train um you might want to get medium shots of you know the ground that was um you know has ruts in it now from the train running into the ground uh, and then you might want to get close-ups of passengers or people that were injured or close-ups of the damage you're going to want to get several different shots wide shots, medium shots, and close-up shots from different angles. And what you're going to do is you're going to get, you know, you're going to use maybe a five-second wide shot and then a ten-second medium shot and then a five-second close-up and you're going to combine all those together into one 20-second video. It's not just going to be 20 seconds of a static shot that's boring. What you have to do is get different angles and get different types of shots. So scripting the voiceover. Uh, usually, a voiceover is going to be about 20 to 30 seconds long. Uh, voiceovers, when you are putting the video together, the video can be all grouped together or it can be separated by wipes. Uh, what a wipe is, is an electronic technique that slides one video picture off the screen and replaces it with another. So, um, so you have the video of your story playing and your video is going and then the anchor goes on to the next story and that video just wipes off the screen and is replaced by another video for another story. Okay. So usually you want to figure out what kind of video do you need to go with your voiceover. So for your assignment, I asked you to write a reader, right? Now I want you to make that a voiceover. So when doing that, you have to figure out, well, what kind of video do I need? Now, in this case, you're not actually going out and doing the story. You're just imagining the story in your head. So the great thing is, you can imagine you're getting any kind of video you want. You know, if you're doing a story about someone that died, you can imagine that you're getting video of the person's um, mom showing you around the room. You know, you can imagine that you're getting... Uh, you know, shots of the fire as it's raging out of control. You can you let your imagination run away with you and imagine what kind of video do you need to go along with the story. Yeah.
Okay. Now, when you are writing a voiceover, we're going to start using what's called the split page format. I'm going to try to bring up an example of a split page script here. And let's see if I can. And I'm going to post this on Canvas too so you can actually like see it well and see the detail. But let's see if I can get it in a mode that you can pretty much see it. Okay, so that's not great because it's really, really tiny. But I'll try to show you this uh, here, the basics of the split page format. So I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in the lecture too, but I just want you to get familiar with it because um, we're about ready to wrap up this first lecture here and then we're going to uh, hit the second video. But on one side you have video and on one side you have audio. Now the audio is actually kind of where you write the story. Uh, it's where you write the copy that you're going to say and the sound bites that you're going to use. But over on the left is video cues. It's going to tell you what the video is showing. And this is really for your tech department's uh, benefit. <laughs> Hi, Gage. Okay. But basically on one side you're, you're giving all the video cues and on the left side you're giving the voiceover cues. So when you script your voiceover, you're going to write your story in that audio column. You're going to write exactly what you're going to say. And it's going to be very easy because it's just a VO. It's just your words. You don't have to worry about a sound bite or a stand up or anything like that. It's just you talking. So you can actually write out the story. 20 to 30 seconds here on the right side. And on the left side, you're going to tell us the video you're showing while you're talking and how long that video is. And also, if we need any graphics, see how there's some fonts listed here? A font is what's going to be written on the screen. So while you're talking, it might say, look, this is Mark Stewart, a local farmer. Okay? So it's video and audio broken up. And again, I'm going to post that on Canvas so that you can see it and kind of study it and get used to it and also use that to format your own story. Okay? So that's uh, two story formats that we've talked about. We've talked about readers and we've talked about VO's voiceovers. And uh, we're getting kind of long here, so that's going to be a good place to stop for now. So I'm going to go ahead and post this video online and then I'm going to tape the second half of the lecture. And again, you can watch that anytime between now and March 31st. You don't have to do it all at once because I would not want to sit here and listen to me talk for an hour and a half straight. But if you're kind that likes to get things done, you're more than welcome to go ahead and watch the next video, which will be posted in Canvas. Thanks. Bye.